morphology in lexical classes. So last time we were looking at these. Eight parts of speech is what you're taught in grade school. Maybe it's a necessary simplification, but the reality is much more complicated. And linguists don't really use the term parts of speech. We call them lexical classes or categories or grammatical or syntactic classes or categories. I prefer lexical. Uh, so and it's kind of an area of morphology. Where do words fit? Uh, I can do it myself. What is that myself? Well, you learn that there are pronouns like he and she and it, but there are actually many other kinds, there are many kinds of pronouns. He, she, it, they, those are personal pronoun pronouns. This is an emphatic pronoun. It's emphasizing I. I is a personal pronoun, but myself is an emphatic pronoun, uh, which if you study Latin grammar, you know. Uh, let's see what else. I have done it before. It was a verb, but it's not a main verb like go and, uh, and study. It's an auxiliary or helping verb. You may know that. Uh, I must do it, modal verb. So there aren't just verbs. Um, auxiliaries and modals, for example, are treated differently. In English, we don't really, don't usually give them word stress like we do with uh, regular content word verbs. So main verbs like study and go and hit, those are lexical verbs, those are content words. Uh, these are minor, more functional type of verbs that give more grammatical information, not so much sentence content. Uh, and they're different. And also did, did functions, for example, to make questions. That's an auxiliary. All, uh, that's kind of a quantifier. You didn't learn about quantifiers, did you? But linguists talk about these as quantifiers and determiners. The, that's an article. Uh, uh, I hate the term article. It's actually a stupid grammar term. Uh, because it's very vague. It's confusing for one thing when I'm teaching a writing class and we talk about written articles like a magazine article, a research article, then you have definite, indefinite articles and it's confusing. Um, the word is confusing. Uh, I don't like that term article. Uh, every quantifier, one is a special type of pronoun. Uh, more is a quantifier. What is, how about well? What is well? Well, I don't think so. It doesn't fit into the standard eight parts of speech, does it? It's a different thing. Uh, it's one of those little function words that kind of manages the flow of information and relationship between you and the listener and the information. Uh, it's, it's kind of a pragmatic syntactic category. Uh, and linguists have different, maybe we'll classify these differently, but generally you can call them a discourse particle because they manage the flow of discourse. Uh, and I don't think so. What's the so? Well, you learn about pronouns, which stand for a, another noun. Well, this is another kind of pro form. The so stands in for a verb phrase, uh, like want more money. I don't think so. Uh, so it stands for like a verb phrase, and we call it a pro form. Uh, like a pronoun stands for another noun. This is another kind of a bigger category of pro forms. So I don't think so. We never learned that. It's, it's not an adverb in, in the sense of uh, softly or gently or often. It, it doesn't work like other adverbs. It goes in its own category. Unfortunately, it, that's an adverb, but is it the same as other adverbs like I hit the ball gently, I hit the ball uh, strongly? forcefully, is it an adverb like that? There aren't just adverbs, there are different subcategories of adverbs. This is a sentence adverb, which is modifying the whole sentence. It indicates your view toward the whole sentence. Again, don't, you don't need to learn all of this right now. Oh, oh, you can go to my website later and, and such. And, uh, I like it there. What is there? Is it an adverb? It's sort of another pro form kind of thing. It stands for a location. So uh, like I is a pronoun and she is a pronoun. Well, there's sort of a pro form for locations. I like it there. Uh, and it works a little differently in English, by the way. In, in Korean, it works more like an, you can be a direct object, like I like there. You can say in Korean, but in English, you have to say I like it there. It was such fun, such is. Uh, Another kind of, uh, it's kind of a uh, degree adverb. Hey, what's hey? Well, that might fit into the intro 
interjection category. Uh, there's a unicorn in my garden. There is, there are. Well, actually, it's kind of like the it in it is raining. What is raining? What does it stand for? When you say it is raining in English, what does it stand for? Does it stand for something? Not really. Uh, it's just there to fill an empty slot because raining has no subject. What is raining? We don't specify it in English. It has no subject. So we put in this dummy pronoun. So that's a dummy pronoun. And there in there's a unicorn in my garden is sort of a special dummy pronoun. Uh, for like presenting something new, a new topic. Ooh, wow. You look at your window and you see unicorn, and you say, well, there's a unicorn in my garden. Uh, I know what you did last summer. I know that you lied about it. The what and the that, there's a special things for putting like one sentence, like you did something last summer into a more complex sentence. I know what you did last summer. I know that you lied about it for, com uh, for forming complex sentences. Uh, and uh, get into that in syntax. Uh, no, not. Uh, are these adverbs? You may have learned that these are adverbs. But do they function like softly and gently? No. They have special functions for negating an idea or negating a verb or negating something. Uh, we just, they don't fit with anything else, and we just call them negative particles. And you'll hear the word particle a bit. I, want, I don't want to eat them. I just. I just do not want to. What is the to? Is it a preposition? Of course not, because it doesn't take a noun object. It can't be a preposition. What is it? It's, it's in its own special category by itself for making infinitive verbs, uh, a verb that doesn't have like a, an expressed subject or time. Um, just, I don't want to. I don't want to go. It's an infinitive particle. And it's about the only thing in English like it. Oh, please, what is, okay, so oh, discourse marker. Uh, it's kind of managing discourse flow. Uh, what is please? Does it fit into like noun, verb, adjective, adverb? No. It's a, so, it's a special category that, uh, it's, it's sort of a pragmatic syntactic category. We call politeness function words. It doesn't go anywhere else. It's for politeness functions. Please, thank you. Thank you. It's not like the individual words have a meaning, but together, thank you, or please, or wel you're welcome. It's just together. It's like one unit in semantically. Uh, it's kind of weird uh, if you think about it. Um, I will try them out. You know, shut up. Put it off. To be over. Are these prepositions here? No, they're not. They come from the class of prepositions, but here they're being used to make a type of compound verb in English we call a phrasal verb. And if you know German, there's something similar in German. Uh, and this is something that's unique to a like, few languages like English, German, I think Dutch. Uh, in these cases, it's not a preposition anymore. It's being used to modify a verb. And if you learn English as a foreign language, these things probably drive you crazy. Uh, because they probably never taught you like any systematic meaning patterns. We might get into that next week, though, when we learn about semantics. Uh, we would call these phrasal verb particles. They're not prepositions in these cases. It's just kind of a little weird thing we call a phrasal verb particle. And now here we'll see young people will say like, oh, it's like I tried them and I was like, hey, these are like not bad. Uh, older people complain about this when they hear teenagers talking like this. This is teenager talk. What is the like here? Maybe you've heard this in like, uh, TV shows and movies. Uh, and older people complain about it. And it's kind of confusing because there are actually two different likes here. Uh, I was like, that's kind of reporting what you're thinking or saying. Uh, so it's kind of like, a, it's kind of like she said, she exclaimed. Uh, it's kind of what we call a reporting expression or a quotative or quoting. You're, but you're not necessarily quoting what you're saying. Maybe this is what I'm thinking. I was like, oh, and these are like, not bad. The other likes, it's like, and like, not bad. Um, it's a kind of a discourse particle. And there are a lot of interesting papers on this. People kind of, you know, kind of debating, what is this? Where does it fit? What is, what's the exact function? When we talk about pragmatics after the midterm, uh, we can 
talk about like. It's kind of interesting. So uh, the reality is that there's a lot more lexical classes in the eight parts of speech. Uh, but you know, how many school children want to learn you know, the uh, 17 parts of speech or the 28 parts of speech? How many are there? Depends on who you ask. Depends on which linguist you ask. Uh, there's no agreed upon uh, consensus for how many there are and how to kind of classify these things. Um, uh, but there are kind of categories and subcategories and sub-subcategories, and there's stuff that doesn't fit anywhere else really nicely, and we'll call them different kinds of particles, as we see. Uh, and different linguists will kind of put them in different categories and such. So we have nouns, proper nouns like Barack Obama, God, I miss him, <laughs> and common nouns like, you know, table and computer and such, uh, adjectives and we can talk about different kinds of adjectives and other kinds of nouns and so on. Adverbs, and there are different kinds of adverbs like manner, ha like softly, degree, like extremely, frequency, like often, emphatic, adverbs like especially, sent sentence adverbs like unfortunately. Again, don't worry about taking notes, just get, get the, maybe I'll put a list of these up on my website later on someday when I have time. Then we have main verbs or lexical verbs, like those that actually are content words that carry actually meaningful content, like hit or exist or disappear or read or study. So these are content words. They're often called open class words because it's easy to make new ones up. And it's easy to make, uh, especially in English, to take a noun and make it a verb, take a verb and make it a noun. Uh, <coughs> and. Uh, so it's, uh, they freely admit new members to these categories, so they're also called open class words. We can easily make up new ones. We can easily make up new nouns when we need a noun, new noun for a new scientific discovery, for example, or new verb. Then we have function words or closed class words, and it's not as often that we make new function words in a language, and it's not so often for one function word to kind of get used in a new category. One example is when like out as a preposition gets used as a phrasal verb particle, like when you say get out, or the like, I'm like, you know, like that was like really cool like, you know, like. Uh, but otherwise we don't, it's not so common for these to kind of create uh, or admit new members. And there are just lots and lots of different kinds here. We got conjunctions, we have adpositions, so English uses prepositions like on the table, uh, uh, under the table. Korean uses postpositions uh, like uh, meet, meet, so the meet on below. Um, Chinese is interesting because Chinese uses kind of both. So zai zhuozi shang, so zai is at, that's a preposition, zhuozi, uh, table, and shang, uh, on top of, or on. And Chinese is interesting because it has kind of a double uh, adposition mix. So the general term is adposition. Um, you have quantifiers, we have articles like A and the, then if a noun doesn't have one like I like coffee, it's different people call it a zero or null article or no article. And then we have different kinds of determiners, uh, each, any, both, and you can get this from the website or the slides uh, later on. There are lots of different kinds of determiners. I'm not going to talk about these. There's just too many. God, there's so many. But um, then we have pronouns, uh, different kinds of pronouns. Like, again, maybe I'll put up a, a page on the website later with more of a uh, list and explanation of these things. The point is there's just so many different kinds of things, uh, especially in the function word categories. Different kinds of pronouns, um, personal like she indefinite like someone, reflexive like themselves, emphatic like I can do it myself, demonstrative like this, that, interjections like hey. Then this, this term particle is kind of a dumping ground for things that you don't know what to do with. Uh, and different linguists will put these in different categories or subcategories uh, somewhere else. Discourse particles like okay, phrasal verb particles like, uh, like get out, negative particles like no and not, Emphatic adverbs like uh, I can do it too, even he can do it, so even, too, also uh, emphatic. And different linguists will classify these differently. Quotatives, uh, I'm like no way, 
or she said, things like that. Let's look at adjectives. Uh, are these the same? Uh, so we have attributive adjectives, which is when an adjective is before a noun, it's a pre-modifier of a noun. And then predicate adjectives, where it's in the predicate after a linking verb or copular verb. Um, an angry storm, is that the same as the storm was angry? Does it mean the same thing? If we say an angry storm, can we also say the storm was angry? Does that sound normal? No, it sounds actually kind of weird. The sorry girl, um, the girl is sorry. Do they mean the same thing? No. The sorry girl, it's a different meaning like pitiable, pitiful, or something like that. And the girl is sorry, she's apologetic. Different meaning. Uh, the responsible man, it's a kind of a good meaning. The man is responsible. Respons responsible for what? Responsible for the accident. Um, and so on. Uh, these can have sometimes different meanings, not always, but sometimes some adjectives can have different meanings in attributive or predicate position. There's some others. Uh, an absolute wreck. Can you say the wreck was absolute? No. Uh, it doesn't make sense. Uh, a complete mess. The mess was complete? No. Definitely not the same meaning. It doesn't quite make sense. Uh, a total idiot? The idiot was total? No. Uh, so some of these just don't even work in predicate position, or they sound funny, or, or the meaning is different. The only way, the way is only? No, it doesn't make sense. Uh, and, and here's some others. I won't go through these. But then down here, um, um, the boy is asleep. Can you say the asleep boy? Uh-uh, it just doesn't make sense. Here's a class of adjectives. These come from Old English. Uh, uh, awake. So the boy is awake. The awake boy? No, that doesn't make sense. The afraid boy? That sounds a little odd. The boy is afraid. The girl is afraid. Uh, alive. The monster is alive. Can you say the alive monster? No, it sounds weird. Uh, so there are some adjectives that can only be predicate, some that can only be attributive, or um, some adjectives that have different meanings in uh, either position. And, now, English has this funny thing about adjective order. Uh, let's say I'm describing a table, and the table is red, and it's large, and it's old, and it's French, it's from France, and it's wood made of wood, and it's good, and it's square. So would I say the red, large, old French wooden good square table in English? English speakers? No. Uh, and this is confusing because I guess in Asian languages, you don't have restrictions on the order of things like this. And if I talk about several, can I put several at the end of the adjectives? Like I have red, large, old, several tables? No, several has to go at the beginning. It's a determiner or quantifier. It has to go before the adjectives. I have several uh, red tables and such. So English is kind of picky. And what's, what's the principle here? Yeah. So. If you're talking about a table, what's the most kind of essential or inherent property? Probably the fact that it's made of wood, because that's maybe the most stable property, the fact that it's made out of wood, it's wooden, and maybe where it was made, it's French. Uh, so uh, although those may be interchangeable, depending on what you want to emphasize in the context, uh, an old wooden French table or an old French wooden table, maybe. I would prefer old wooden French table, but in c certain contexts, you can switch them maybe. Other things like uh, square, triangular, large, those are maybe less essential properties, so we tend to put them uh, a bit further away from the actual noun. So th the most essential adjectives tend to be closest to the noun in, in English. Uh, and again, it can vary somewhat depending on what you are emphasizing or what you view as essential. Um, but the tendency generally is this and you know evaluation oh misspelling evaluation uh, like good bad pretty um, size age shape and color may, although this may, may be interchangeable uh, like square red red square uh, French uh, wooden table or something and again 
7 and 8 may be interchangeable, but this is the tendency in English, and you can find this on the internet or in my slides. Uh, so English ha is sort of a semantic, cognitive kind of uh, view of what's really more essential to the tableness of it or the sophiness. With verbs, we've got main lexical verbs. We've got linking verbs like be and uh, is. We've got modal verbs. Uh, you know some of this already, auxiliaries. And we've got phrasal verbs like get out, which is a verb plus a particle. Usually it's Old English words like, uh, or old words in the language, basic uh, vocabulary words like get and go that do this. Um, there's maybe at least 10,000 possible phrasal verbs in English, probably more. And we can make up new ones when we need to. Um, there are some semantic tendencies, which maybe we'll talk about next week. Uh, now, languages do what's called inflection. So inflectional morphology is uh, when you add endings to indicate grammatical information about the verb, like who did it, how many people did it, uh, when, the tense, and, and such. Uh, and other languages like English, we more so rely on auxiliaries, like I have and I will, and pronouns like I and such. Uh, languages, especially Western languages, tend to inflect or change endings on verbs or change the auxiliaries uh, according to things like person, number, gender, like singular, plural, uh, uh, first person like I, we, second person you, third person is she or they, uh, and sometimes gender, male, masculine, feminine, or neuter. Uh, tense, uh, so tense is the relationship between the speaker and the event, like if it's in the past, compared, or in relation to me speaking now, I would say I, uh, this, uh, uh, Romans went home, Romans have gone home, if it's recent, uh, now Romans are going home, uh, if it's uh, future, Romans will go home, uh, and that's tense. But there's also something that kind, of, kind of overlaps with it, and that's called aspect, which is the event itself, is the event itself so apart from my perspective is the event itself, is it, uh, is it regular habitual, like Romans go home at five o'clock, or is it progressive, like Romans are now going home? Is it uh, maybe action that's not yet completed or imperfective, Romans were going home, uh, but you're looking at it as an ongoing action in the past, Romans will be going home? Or is it completed in the past, Romans went home, have gone home, Yea, the Romans have gone home. <coughs> uh, now the Greeks, are, no, after the Romans. Uh, uh, mood is, um, especially in Western languages, okay, so indicative means you're viewing it as factual. Romans are going home. Uh, you're talking about maybe a, a factual event or potentially factual event. Imperative, like ite is go, imperative, a command, go, go home, ite. Uh, so the, the guy originally wrote eunt, which is the indicative, they are going home, which didn't make sense in the context, eunt, it's an irregular Latin verb. Um, then the, we have different languages have what's called subjunctive, conditional, or optative. I wish the Romans would go home, would go. Uh, if only the Romans would go home, the Romans might go home. So contrary to fact, wishes, kind of things like that. Um, then some languages, not so much Western languages, maybe indicate evidentiality of Romans are going home, I know it for a fact, or in some languages you have maybe verb endings for other things, I heard the Romans are going home, or uh, there's a rumor that Romans are going home, or the Romans must be going home, you know, they're, they're, they're not here anymore, they must be going home, and they must have gone. Uh, so uh, assumptions about how do you know this, that's the basis for knowing this. <coughs> so. Inflectional morphology is using grammatical endings on words to indicate this. And we'll see some examples in a little bit. Uh, English doesn't have much inflectional morphology. So some languages rely a lot on endings on verbs, for example, and endings on nouns and adjectives to give you grammatical information. English doesn't so much. English has pretty simple inflectional morphology. Instead, we use like auxiliary verbs, and um, we do have plural markers, but otherwise, English relies more on syntax for that. 
Like, I have gone to express the perfect tense. Uh, he did go. Uh, so rely in English more on syntax, on word, like help function words and the word order to express minor grammatical information, like when did it happen, how many people did it, were they masculine, feminine, is it first person like we, is it third person like they. English relies more on function words and thus the syntax, the function words in their order, the order of function words and content words. Other languages rely a lot on inflectional morphology, things like word endings or prefixes, affixes. Derivational morphology is forming new words. So while English has pretty simple inflectional morphology with a fairly complex derivational morphology, that's for making new words. Like morphology is morph, a Greek element meaning form, and ology meaning study of. And we'll see English has fairly complicated derivational morphology. A free morpheme is a morpheme that can exist by itself. So any independent word, like and or Go or Romans or computer, those are free morphemes. A bound morpheme is, uh, so a bound morpheme or greenhouse, you can make compounds and in English, some compounds are written together, some compounds are written as separate words, but it's still a compound. There's no regular rule, it depends on maybe how frequent it is and how nice it looks written as one word with no space or whatever. Um, then we have bound morphemes like the sieve and receive and the jud and prejudice that can exist by itself. Uh, those are Latin words that can exist by themselves, including affixes, prefixes and suffixes and infixes. Uh, so let's look at English inflectional morphology. It's pretty simple. We have the S ending for plurals and possessives. We have past tense endings, the ED or EN. Um, we have present progressives, including participles, so she is escaping, present progressive, or the participle. So participle, in this case, is a form of the verb that's used as an adjective, so escape being lion, the lion that's escaping. So it's kind of a verbal adjective. So this is a present participle, the ing, the escaping lion, so it's a verbal adjective. It's kind of part verb, but also functioning as an adjective, the escaping lion. Uh, then you have past participles, the captured lion, the lion that was captured. So it's a verbal modifier, a verbal adjective, participles. Um, then we have um, the EREST for some superlative comparative words, and we have irregular verbs or strong verbs like swim, swam, swum, teach, taught, and, and so on. Uh, other languages have more complex morpho uh, inflectional morphology. So the word the in German, uh, I've underlined these are all the, but it has a different form depending on the role in the sentence, subject or object, uh, masculine, feminine, neuter, uh, etc. Der alte Mann hat dem alten Hund und der alten Katze das alte Fleisch, den alten Schnitzel, die alten Getränke gegeben. The man, the old man gave the old dog and the old cat. Uh, let me point to it. Yeah, the old man gave the old dog and the old cat the old meat, the old uh, cutlet, uh, like Donkas, and the old drinks. Gegeben is at the end. Uh, uh, so if I kind of take out the alt the, and put in some glosses. Mm. Western languages tend to have case systems where we indicate the sentence function and we have different, you know, uh, inflections for sentence functions. Uh, so uh, subject is nominative, demon. Dative is an indirect object to whom something is given or for whom something is given or done. Uh, so dative, dative, uh, that's uh, indirect object to whom something is done. Uh, nom uh, oh, sorry, that, that should be accusative. Sorry, it's a mistake. Accusative is a direct object. Uh, and let's show you a Latin example. Caterva carissima mea est chimictus. My favorite group, my favorite band is the Beatles. So we have agreement. So caterva is a feminine noun, like a band or a group. And then 
uh, the adjectives have a me uh, ending that matches or agrees with the noun in terms of gender and whether it's like the subject or object or indirect object in languages like Latin. A lot of Western languages have this, they have agreement. So we have noun genders, masculine, feminine, neuter, for example, or masculine, feminine. And then we have these different sentence functions like subject, object. And the adjectives will agree with the noun, for example. Uh, and the verbs will agree with whether the noun is singular, plural, uh, and, and uh, gender and such. So we have these case systems for nouns in Western languages. Uh, so we call, and again, you don't need to know these terms unless you want to study Latin or German, uh, for example, uh, or Russian. Uh, non nominative is a subject, genitive is possessive, dative is uh, like to or for whom, accusative, direct object. Some languages have an instrumental by which something is done. Uh, uh, with, a man, with a pen, you can influence many people. And some languages have special cases for certain prepositional ideas, uh, away from in Latin. I, I think Finnish, the Finnish language has a lot of these prepositional type cases like one kind of noun ending for away from and one for to or toward and one for uh, uh, at and, and such. So some languages like Finnish and, and such have complex now case systems. Um, we have like masculine, feminine, and some languages neuter nouns. And it's not that tables and computers are inherently male or female. It's sort of a noun class or a noun category. And it's somewhat arbitrary. Uh, sometimes it depends on the wording things like ER nouns, words in, like computer. In German, they're just masculine. Uh, in German, trained at Zug, it's derived from a <coughs> irregular verb. And so the rule is if the noun that Zug comes from an irregular verb, it's masculine. But if a noun comes from the stem of a regular verb, it's feminine. Uh, they're sort of just noun classes, and, it, and it's not necessarily biological sex or gender. Uh, so in, uh, in German, der Löffel, uh, the spoon is masculine, die Gabel, the knife, is feminine, and das Messer, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the fork, die Gabel, is feminine, and das Messer, the knife, is neuter. Why? I don't know. They're just somewhat arbitrary noun categories. Uh, so if you're very strict, you might want not want to mix your spoons in your forks, you don't want them doing naughty things together. I get, no, 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 it's not like that. They're somewhat arbitrary noun classes. And in Bantu languages like Swahili, you've got like 10 noun classes for different kinds of things, uh, like people now, animate nouns that refer to like animals and uh, things that are alive and moving, animates, uh, inanimates, um, fruits, uh, sometimes Swahili is called, the language Swahili is called Ki Swahili because Ki, so Swahili does it with prefixes. So Ki Swahili is this one for artifacts and tools and some abstract concepts like languages. So Swahili is sometimes called Ki Swahili because the Ki is a prefix for that noun class. Uh, Turkish. Turkish has some crazy inflection. Where's our Turkish speaker here? Can you pronounce? So I had uh, one time a Turkish guy, he wrote the first one down for me, and I also got this off the internet. And he told me at the time it's the longest word in Turkish, but I found number two. So I don't know if you, so it's not like normal, something you'd normally say, but it does show the extreme complexity. You just glue a lot of stuff, a lot of uh, grammatical information directly into the verbs in Turkish. That's inflectional. So some languages have a lot of inflections. That is, you put a lot of the, these grammatical markers and you just glue them onto the verbs. Or you, you put noun in endings on nouns to indicate their function or role in the sentence. So that's inflectional morphology. So some languages rely more on inflectional morphology for expressing these grammatical functions, but other languages like English rely more on function words, separate function words. So we rely on the syntax. So they do this similar functions. This is the some languages prefer to do it through inflections. Some prefer to do it through function words, the syntax. We talk about derivational morphology. English gets a little more complicated. This is forming words. Uh, so derivational itself 
is an example. It's from Latin. De means from. The, the riva is Latin word for river. So imagine like, so it's kind of a metaphor, like down the river. So the river kind of, you know, well, if you're looking at it like in a certain way, it kind of splits into separate streams, although it's actually streams flowing into the river. So it's streams flowing into the main river. North Han River and the South Han River, they flow together. So from downstream, from the river, riva is river. And the ion and the al are uh, suffixes. German does some crazy compounding, Rechtsschutzversicherungsgesellschaften, companies that provide personal insurance. Krankenpolizeug Hauptpflichtversicherung, that's like uh, insurance policy for uh, uh, cargo vehicles. Donaudampf Schifffahrtsgesellschaftskapitän, a captain of a of a steamer ship that sails on the Danube River. Not normal usage, but it, it, they exist in the dictionary. English, we have, well, they're, they're just a couple. Anti-disestablishmentarianism, oppo opposition to separation of church and state. Uh, and that's the longest word you find in a regular dictionary. Uh, in the really huge dictionaries in libraries, the Webster's New Third International Dictionary, kind of the most official, super large dictionary of English, you'll find pneumonal ultramicroscopic silico volcanoconiosis. Uh, not a normal word. Let me break these down for you with the morpheme boundaries. Now, there's a little controversy about that because actually there already is a word for it, silicosis. It's a disease. But some doctor made up pneumonal ultramicroscopic silico volcanoconiosis when there was already the word silicosis just because he wanted to make up the longest word in English. There are a few other words, functionalistically, maybe the longest common word in English, uh, longest slang term, ex, uh, supercalifragilistic no, super expialidocious. That's in an old Disney movie. They made it up just for the movie, but there's a song with that title. Supercalifragilistic expialidocious is a word that just means very good. Oh, it's a very, oh, how did you do on the exam? Oh, I got a supercalifragilistic expialidocious grade. Not a word we normally use. It's just in an old Disney song. You can find it on YouTube. A movie called Mary Poppins. Let's see what else? There is a surgery in a medical dictionary, hepaticocholangiocholecystoterostomy, something. Anyway, you can find those on your own. Compounds. So we have some Anglo-Saxon compounds. Uh, so a lot of English words just can be directly compounded. That's very common in English. Uh, not so common in Romance languages. For example, Spanish. Who's a Spanish speaker? When I learned Spanish, I learned, like the only compound word I remember was limpia para prisas, windshield wipers, but you don't really compound words directly in Spanish very much. English does it a lot, kind of like German. We have some old English, Anglo-Saxon prefixes, like the re and the for. We have some suffixes. So let me answer the daily poll question now. This er, est tends to be used with words from Anglo-Saxon, that is the old German part of our language. Now it tends, it's it happens that these, these tend to be shorter words, so loud, louder, loudest. And then we have some words from Old French, like pretty, pr like you could say pretty, pretty, or prettiest. That's most common. You could say more pretty, most pretty. But it's generally the case that um, the most basic words in English, especially the Anglo-Saxon words, so if you know German, this is easy. The Old German part of our language, the core everyday vocabulary tends to take E-R-E-S-T for these adjective forms. Other words that come from other languages tend to take the more most, and they may tend to be longer, but not always. Now, this weird kind of in-between category is words from Old French. So again, like pretty, pretty, or prettiest, most common, clearer, or clearest. You could say more clear, m most clear, but it's with these Old French words, it's more common to use because they're, they're sort of part of the everyday core vocabulary. Infixes. So you might have read in the book about infixes. So something you stick in, you cut up like a word in, in the middle and stick something inside the word. Uh, it's more common in other languages in the world, not so much English. But there is one case I have found in English. Uh, it's a kind of slang expression. It's not very common. It's an occasional slang expression. Maybe you've heard of absolute effing lutely. Bad word, I, I won't say it, lest I offend some more sensitive listeners here or some euf a euphemism is a word that's less offensive, substitute. So absolute blooming lutely, absolute freaking lutely, or absolute effing lutely. That's one case of an infix in English. It's kind of unusual. But that's like, there are some languages in the world that actually do that a lot regularly for their uh, morphology. 
Then we have Latin prefixes uh, and stems and suffixes. Then we have Greek compounds. So, I mean, you can, if you want to know more, you can go on the internet. You can find whole lists of Latin morphemes and Greek morphemes in English. I won't go through this here. But we have prefixes, stems, suffixes from Latin and then from Greek. Um, and most academic words are from Latin and Greek. And again, you, you can look on the internet if you want to know more about this. But this is why English word formation is really complicated. We have Anglo-Saxon and Old French word elements. We have Latin, we have Greek word elements and such. Uh, so again, the E-R-E-S-T tends to be with Anglo, with more basic vocabulary, especially Anglo-Saxon, maybe the Old French part of our language. We'll talk about the history of English later on. So words from other languages tend to uh, form uh, their comparative and superlative forms with more and most, which is a French pattern. So it's a French influence on English. So for example, you take words like smug and glib. Um, these are two words sort of like uh, he answered rather really smugly or glibly, like, oh, he doesn't care, he's kind of arrogant, he doesn't care. He's kind of very smug about it, he's very glib about it. So English speakers, do you, do you say smugger, smuggest? Glibber, glibbest? No. Even though these are one-syllable words. Why? These came into English from Dutch in kind of medieval times. So these are from Dutch. So you don't say smugger or smuggest. You say more smug, most smug. That's the most smug or the most glib response I've ever heard. So the rule that you were taught, if you're taught that rule, it doesn't really work. Uh, it depends on what language the words come from. So again, if you want to be really good in English, all you need to do is to learn uh, German, French, uh, Dutch, uh, Spanish, Latin, Greek, uh, maybe a couple of others, and then your English would be great. We'll talk about the history of English uh, later on, but that's why English is a complex history, and that's why the, the, the morphology uh, the, the word formation is complicated in English. You see all these Greek and Latin and Anglo-Saxon and Old French elements. And then we can kind of, uh, again, I think the book has a little bit more about this. Um, here's an example. This is not a common word, but you could say unbuttonability. It can have two meanings. Uh, so sometimes there's ambiguity here. It can be uh, impossible to fasten using buttons, so you can't, uh, you can't button it up, or it is possible to unfasten using buttons, so the unbuttonability. It's not a normal word. It's possible, though, but this shows um, that there is occasionally ambiguity uh, in derivational morphology. And you can kind of diagram it two ways. So here we have unbutton, so uh, it can be unbuttoned, unbutton. So the un makes a negative of, the, of a noun or verb. And then you add able, uh, the adjective in ity, which makes that into a noun. Uh, so just like the, the tree structure we saw a little bit earlier with syntax, you can also do the same for morphology. I'm not, not going to go into this too much, and I won't require you to learn this tree structure. Th but this is a convenient way of showing um, the word formation patterns. So this means it can be unbuttoned, I, the unbuttonability of a shirt. This means that it cannot be buttoned up. So kind of an opposite meaning. Uh, uh, so um, buttonability, and then you negate it with the un. And the un is an old English uh, prefix to, for not. And because button is an old English or old French word. And, and so sometimes you have, these are kind of sometimes called contronyms because it's one word that has two possible and kind of opposite meanings. So a contronym. So occasionally in languages you get a contronym, one word that can have two opposite meanings. A common example is the word sanction, which can mean in certain contexts, uh, I give my approval, like um, um, the church refused to sanction King Henry's divorce. 
in other cases, it means to punish, like the U.S. is imposing sanctions on that country, uh, punishment for something we disapprove of. So, so sometimes you get these weird contronyms. It has to do with the history of the word usage. Oh, okay. So this is not possible. You can't uh, un. You can't negate the button ability. That's. And I don't think this is in the book, but we also get word blends. This is becoming more common in modern English and thanks to the internet. So you take two words and you blend them. So telethon is really a blend of tele, the prefix tele, and marathon. Frenemy, so somebody who is kind of a friend and enemy at the same time. I think of the master in Doctor Who, I guess. Bromance, so like two guys who are just really, really close friends emotionally, a bromance like it's on emoticon, brunch, sitcom. There are lots more of these in English. Word blending. Interesting word blend is Watergate has be so this is kind of relevant now, interestingly. So when Nixon was president, some of his men broke into the Watergate building. The name of the building was Watergate because they were breaking into the Democratic Party's headquarters in the Watergate building. So Watergate became synonymous with the scandal. And so we've taken the word gate and we started making so many word blends with gate that it's practically become a suffix. And there are so many gates now with the newest Ukraine gate. And if you don't know what's happening in the news, Ukraine gate is the new thing. Uh, if you don't know, you need to uh, hop online and find out what's going on in the world. So there are all kinds of gates. Another oddity is the word flammable which means something that can catch on fire. And you would think that inflammable would have the opposite meaning, but it doesn't. Because in Latin, the in has two meanings. In meaning into, and in meaning not. But in this case, it's the in meaning like into. So it can catch, it can go into flames, literally. It's inflammable. So flammable and inflammable are synonyms. They have the same meaning. It's flammable. It's also inflammable, meaning it can go into flames, literally, which is confusing. Non-flammable is the opposite. It's not flammable. Okay, this material is non-flammable. So that's kind of a crazy thing about English. Yes, I know. I English is weird. And it's complicated. Uh, it's got the biggest vocabulary of any language in the world. Again, because of like the Anglo-Saxon, the French, Latin, and Greek, and other word elements, and another, in, in the history of English, we've got just like this whole buffet of morphemes to choose from, and we can make up new words all the time, very easily. And we have, especially for academic English. So that uh, English is about two-thirds Latin, either uh, via Old French or from modern times through academic work. And then some of Greek, probably 10% or less is from Greek, especially technical terms. A few oddities, so this is not a, a normal word. Phobia, you know, is an, ir an irrational fear. So there's this guy named Gary Larson. He was a famous cartoonist in the 80s. Uh, you may have seen some of his comics, perhaps. He did a comic called Farside. He made up this word, an antidephobia, uh, from a Greek word for a type of duck. The fear that somewhere a duck is watching you. He was famous for very strange humor, very strange cartoons, strange surrealistic humor. Uh, so you just made up this word, an antidephobia, the fear that somewhere a duck is watching you. And, and that's not a normal word. It's not a real word. He just made it up for a cartoon. But you can do that in English. Now, he also made up another word, thagomizer. So here we have one of his famous cartoons where you have a caveman teaching other cavemen, other cavemen about the stegosaurus. You know that type of dinosaur? It's called the stegosaurus. Here the teacher is saying, now this end is called the thagomizer after the late Thag Simmons. So late means dead or deceased. Now, thag is kind of a cartoonish word. So if you, in a cartoon, a name that sounds like a, what, a caveman name might be thag or og or ook. So it's sort of a caveman kind of name. Thag Simmons is the name of a guy who died due to one of these things. So thagomizer, it's a word that Gary Larson made up. The izer, the I-Z-E, that Greek ending meaning to do, like atomizer. So he made the word thagomizer. So it's funny because it's called a thagomizer because it killed a, a caveman named Thag. And the funny thing is, scientists didn't actually have a word for this thing on stegosaurus tails. And, but because of this, scientists 
they needed a name for it later on, so scientists actually started using the word thagomizer for this part of the stegosaurus tail. So a cartoonist made up a word that has started to be used by the scientific community for thagomizer. That's kind of a quick tour of morphology, and there's just so much more. I'm, I'm not going to dump a bunch of Latin and Greek morphemes on you. You can find that on the internet if you want to, but our next topic will be semantics. So let's look at an area where there's an overlap between morphology and semantics. One time I was watching, this is back in the States, I was watching TV late one night, and there was a TV commercial, an advert for some cookware, and they said, if you call now, we'll throw in a free hand chopper. Now, being a linguist, I kind of overthink these things. So a hand chopper, ow, why would I want that? It sounds painful. So what is a hand chopper? What can it mean? What is the intended meaning? So what would a normal person think of as a hand chopper? So it's, a, yeah, so it's, <laughs> so that's what I thought. Like, I don't want to chop my hand. So I'm thinking, you know, like garlic chopper is something for chopping garlic. Onion chopper is for chopping onions. Hand chopper, ow, no. But a normal person would have understood, not a linguist like me, but a normal person would have understood hand chopper is not an electric chopper, but it's something used by hand. So there's a semantic difference uh, between those things. So there's a semantic relationship. So chopper, so hand chopper is a compound. Uh, we can make up new compound words in English easily and it's not written together. The book may have talked about head noun. So chopper is a head noun. It kind of, uh, so like greenhouse, green is an adjective, house is a noun, but greenhouse is a noun because house is a noun. So semantically, the last part of an English compound is called the head uh, of a compound phrase. So reverse engineer, uh, reverse is like an adjective adverb, Engineer is a verb, in this case, to reverse engineer. So you are a computer company and you put out a new computer. Your competition wants to imitate your technology. They can't just steal your technology. So they'll buy one of your computers and they'll take it apart and they figure out how it works and how they can get, make their own computer that does the same kind of thing that you made it do. That's cool. It's reverse engineering. So reverse engineer, because engineer is a verb, reverse engineer is a verb. So the, the last part of a compound phrase is the head, semantically. The meaning, the kind of word class, whether it's a noun or verb, depends on the head of the compound, which in English is the last part. But the funny thing that English does is where's the main word stress when you say it? Hand chopper, hand chopper. So the word stress on compounds usually goes in the first part, but in terms of determining what lexical category in the main meaning, the last part is the semantic head. So main stress goes on the first part. The last part is the semantic head, chopper. It's a chopper, it's some kind of chopper. What is it a chopper for? It's for using by hand or for chopping your hand. So what's the difference in meaning between a hand chopper, something you use by hand uh, versus something for chopping your hand, which I hope nobody would sell. I don't think that would sell too well. There are different semantic relationships here. And so we're going to get into what's uh, called semantic roles. If you look at these, for example, so take a look at these for a few minutes uh, and talk to each other. What's the semantic relationship between the first part and the head noun? So the head noun is the semantic head. It's like in book cover, cover is the semantic head. The last part is the head semantically of the noun phrase, or the compound. So talk to each other for a couple of minutes. What are the semantic relationships? So in one, you've got one kind of semantic relationship, two, you've got a second kind, and so on. So look at these and talk to each other for a few minutes. What's the relationship semantically, meaning-wise, between the first and the second part of these compound nouns?